Future of Clothing, and uh, this is uh, going to be a great event because, the, well, I leave it to others to in, in, in introduce the folks who are going to be up here on the stage. Uh, you know, the clothing industry, uh, this, is, this is put on by uh, both the Hub and BGI Net Impact, and uh, yeah, the, uh, the clothing industry is really quite important to us at, uh, at BGI. It's interesting that so many of our graduates have gone into this business. We're particularly uh, proud of Stacy Flynn and Tasha Cop Copeland, who is Loop Pool, just uh, won the regional Walmart's Better Living Business Plan Challenge. <laughs> there's lots of others. Uh, Alchemy Goods, which uh, began uh, with uh, taking uh, bicycle inner tubes and turning it into messenger bags. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, uh, Hub and Bespoke. They said, well, why, why don't women ride bicycles to work? And they came to an interesting conclusion. Maybe women don't want to show up and work in spandex. <laughs> what if we provided an alternative bicycle clothing that you'd actually be willing to come to work in? And this went over so well that they discovered men don't really like to uh, come to work in spandex either. <laughs> so, hence a men's line also. And we have folks in the apparel industry sustainability movement in various places. Letitia Webster, who is head of sustainability for VF Corporation, which is Levi's and Wranglers and uh, North Face and a whole bunch of other brands you uh, mentioned. And, and Betsy Blaisdell, who as a class project worked on a retail index, which is now used by Target, The Gap, Walmart, Levi Strauss, and so forth. So our, our students are going out there and having a great impact on the world, and we're, we're really uh, proud of that. I want to give particular thanks uh, to Stacy. I think is a big part of the energy behind why this happened, and also Hannah and Marissa Gant, who uh, were right in there uh, helping, and uh, also Jen Martinez. and. Uh, I'm very proud of all of them. And so, Anna, it's up to you to introduce our panel. Thank you, I actually have the, the pleasure of introducing Stacy. Uh, but before I do, I wanted to um, tell everyone a little bit about Net Impact, which is a professional development and networking organization. Um, composed of Metro and hybrid students at BGI. We really believe um, in opening spaces for our colleagues to create opportunities to really realize their full potential in ways that, that build their brands, that make connections, and that create value for themselves and everyone around them. So we do that with these monthly series in Seattle. We also create spaces for students to work on their professional development plans. 
and lots of other things like the business case competitions. So um, tonight I, I want to thank um, BGI and the marketing department, specifically Allie um, and Amanda uh, and many other people who have helped us to promote these events. Um, we're so excited that we're downstairs in the hub for the first time as part of the Inspire series. Um, in the last year, these monthly events have really grown quite a bit. And um, it's, it's great to see everyone here. So in addition, um, I particularly want to thank Marissa, who um, joined me in um, helping to uh, create this event and has done a lot of the behind the scenes planning to make this so seamless and successful. Jen Martinez joined our team midway through. She's entering the industry as a um, sustainable sourcing and ethical manufacturing expert. Really excited um, for what she's doing uh, with denim down in San Antonio. Woo! Woo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but mostly, um, yeah, I want to recognize Stacy, who is just a fireball of energy. And last year, um, you know, we're uh, colleagues, C tens in the program together. And I heard Stacy say that. Dying clothing, making clothing, is the second most polluting industrial activity in the world. And I was floored. I had no idea. I mean, I had given some thought to the social impacts of uh, retail and uh, textile manufacturing, but really opened my eyes. And I knew that in this year of leadership uh, with Net Impact that I really wanted to put on one big event. Now, Marissa and Dushka are part of the Net Impact team who really anchor the monthly events. And I, um, I'm based in Connecticut, so I'm not here as much to do the, the events. But um, when Stacy said that, I was like, this is something that we need to talk about. And she's got so much energy. We started talking about this in October, planning this event. And she really wanted to do a conference, a, like a multi-day conference. And I was like, Stacy, it's a Wednesday night after. <laughs> and so, just consider this practice for your conference, and that's that's uh, that's what this is. So, um, consider it a, a primer with um, experts in the field. I'll let Stacy introduce the panelists. Um, excited for you to be here. I hope that this is informative and that um, you stick around afterwards to meet some really great people. Thank you. Stacy, thanks so much, Hannah, Marissa. You guys are amazing managers, so I appreciate all of your help, and you guys have done so much work, especially you, Hannah, who's actually given me the confidence to get up here and talk about the work that I do. I've been making fabric and clothing for about 16 years now, and um, I've, had, I've seen a lot of the pieces of the industry uh, through my work. Um, but in 2010, I went on one particular trip to China. And I'd been to China many times um, in my travels, and uh, I always thought of my work as being an economic exchange or an economic transaction. I had a job to do, I had objectives, I had to fulfill those objectives, come home. But in 2010, um, I saw what my work was doing to people. And um, I started to realize how much of an impact I, as one person, had on this industry. And I honestly became a little bit of ashamed of myself for not being able to see that. Um, and it kind of got me onto this path of, okay, Stacy, if one person can do so much damage unintentionally, meaning me, um, what can that one person do intentionally for good? And that's what I'm getting behind. And when I started to uh, connect with BGI and eventually started my um, MBA with BGI, and since I have um, been on this rocket ship, if you will, of looking at this industry through multiple lenses, which I had never had visibility to before. Um, 
The reason this particular event is so important is because it's a conversation. It's a conversation that needs to be had. The future of clothing is something that I consider to be very important. Um, and I know it's important to all of you because you're all wearing clothing. Um, these four speakers have all had a significant impact on the industry because of the work that they do. And um, they are all uh, coming from very different vantage points in the future of clothing. Kevin Mayette uh, is the Director of Product Development and Sustainable, Sustainable Development at REI. And I, um, I know Kevin is famous because he was um, mentioned in the editor's opening of one of the Ecotextile News magazines that I read, and they basically thanked him on a global level for his contribution. Um, Nicole uh, is with Prana, and I have had the pleasure of having several conversations with Nicole. Um, she is really looking at the social side of this industry, and she's one of the pioneers looking at how people are affected by the work that we do. Shannon and I met last summer. She came through town. Uh, she was filming people for a documentary when, uh, uh, she, about change makers in the textile and apparel industry, and we've stayed in touch ever since, and um, I can't wait to see what kind of work you do in the future, Shannon. I'm really excited. And Anne Sodeman, um, Anne hired me uh, in 2010 to work for Rethink. Um, and Anne has been one of the most influential people in my career um, because you've given me two things. You've given me a critical opinion of the work I do, and you've given me space to do the work that I need to do. So. Um, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for you in this industry, and I really look forward to hearing what you have to say about, about sustainability in apparel. So I think that, that that's it. I'm going to go ahead and have Kevin come up, and then after Kevin is done, I will um, call Nicole up, and then Shannon, and then Anne will finish off, and then we'll move into a Q&A session. Sounds good? So I'm going to compress about seven years of, of work that actually given referred to in the, the index uh, down to 10 minutes. Um, <clears throat> And um, the title of this uh, presentation is actually uh, something that is uh, from our soon-to-be ex-CEO at REI, uh, Sally Jewell. Uh, Kevin Hagen, you remember this, uh, this, this, this statement here. Sustainability is a team sport. And we'll kind of get to what that means as we go through the, the presentation. Here. Um, just the down button here. Cool. So uh, I always put this up whenever I talk about REI because it just reminds me that it's not just about selling stuff, it's about getting people outdoors. And, and, and getting outdoors so people appreciate the great outdoors and they become stewards of the planet. However, one of the things that um, I'd like to talk about, and this is really an important aspect of how we address sustainability, is is it really an ethic um, or is it a business imperative? And the reality is um, it's both. Um, but the challenge that we see is when, when uh, profit, in, when, when it's treated purely as an ethic, when profit is not there, we frequently can say, you know what, we're going to have to cut back on some things. When in fact what we should really be doing is looking at it is it is really about driving profit. It's driving the business and it's moving it forward. We want to remove that actually, that word sustainability from what we do. And move this here a little. So what are those drivers? What are the things that really are uh, an element of, of why we're doing this? Um, first and foremost is um, resource scarcity. And yes, you can't spend time in the supply chain, as referred to a few minutes ago, without seeing the waste that we have uh, across the apparel, and not just apparel, but in all aspects of the supply chain. 
And it, 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 there's a huge opportunity, for, uh, there's really low, a lot of low-hanging fruit. Um, secondly is, um, is, is increased uh, government regulation. Uh, it, it, whether it be chemicals to full footprinting, this is actually a Levi's hang tag for France, where um, their, their, their footprinting, this is actually a pilot in place, um, and as a retailer or even a brand, how prepared are you to be able to speak to eutrophication? Thirdly, is that there's plenty of examples of, of uh, you know, non-governmental organizations and uh, interest groups, rightfully so, addressing the challenges of the apparel world. And we have to address this. We have to get ahead of this. We have to be the solution. And we're working very hard at that. You know, the, you know, some of these are risk mitigation. One of the real positive aspects of this here has been, um, as we've seen in our organization, is huge opportunities for, uh, for innovation. And we're seeing people, I mean, one of our designers actually, in redesigning one of our styles, um, saved enough fabric last year, the, I love this metric, enough material to uh, cover the entire, um, it's now called the CenturyLink dome, or CenturyLink field, um, just for one style. And this is by providing them with the tools that they can actually start um, uh, uh, being way more sustainable in their design. And then lastly, um, it's, it's all about the consumer. You know, and, and the consumer's there. I don't put them first um, because it's, it's, it's a difference between what do they expect versus what do they demand. And we're really working hard to understand what that is. So why? Um, why a global industry index? Why are we working towards this? And I'll just kind of get to that in these next statements. So um, back uh, in the mid-2000s uh, or so, uh, as we were trying to approach the challenge of uh, uh, of sustainability, um, there is all sorts of ways that, you know, that really just cause confusion in the marketplace. But there were three leaders that actually came out with some 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 great tools. That being uh, Timberland in their Green Index, Patagonia in their uh, their tools in uh, the Footprint Chronicles and Nike's Considered. Um, but it's still a cacophony of claims. The challenge is that um, it's really you know, as the, the measures of sustainability evolve, uh, the, the language wasn't consistent, and we really needed, we, you know, the, the tools to do that. One company doesn't have enough leverage to make that change. Um, you know, the solutions are really hard to share. It's really, what we really needed is a single way to speak of these, these challenges. So actually, um, uh, I, I think Kevin, you actually used this slide first, uh, which is really, I didn't realize what we were doing, which is, uh, is how do we, how do we leverage? How do we leverage what we are as an organization? How do we leverage an industry to actually make change? And that started with um, uh, when Timberland introduced the Green Index, um, challenging um, Betsy, actually it was, to, to uh, let's bring this thing global. So very soon, we had um, 30 organizations, and then 100 organizations, and then 200 organizations, and we're all working towards the same thing, which is how do we really address the challenge of sustainability? So the question was from the beginning is, where do you start? How do, how do you, I mean, we, were, we sit in this room and like, okay, that's great. Well, we're not speaking the same language. Um, what, what do we need to do? And how do we actually move forward? Because there were plenty that say, you know, let's like address recycled materials or let's, uh, let's talk more about it. Let's get more communicative about this and talk to consumers. We decided to start um, in a place of measurement because it's, it's challenging, you can't manage what you don't measure. So that's where we really started the effort. But we recognized that we ultimately need to get to action, solving problems, also buzz. And buzz, I say buzz because it's more about, uh, it's not just talking, it's listening and really being engaged in the whole subject of sustainability. So we're starting with an index, uh, industry index, um, in the measurement phase, but ultimately, um, how do we find the balance of all of these so that we can have great tools of measurement, really direct energy and action towards action, and really be engaged in that whole process? So the question um, is, uh, so uh, great, we're going to work on an index. What does it do? And where does it go? Because originally the green index was consumer facing, or is consumer facing. Um, so our first question was, do we want something consumer facing? Do we want another index? Do we want another label to, to face the consumers? Or do we want to spend all our time, at least at the beginning, really building capacity in the supply chain? 
so they can understand the incredible complexities of which uh, are embedded in sustainability. So we chose the latter, and this is exactly where we've been. We have this aspiration of going consumer-facing, but right now, we're very much and very embroiled in actually uh, working towards the, uh, the building the, the tools for the supply chain. So uh, what's the framework of, an e uh, of a value chain index? Um, it, it's got to be full life cycle. So it runs all the way from, uh, you know, the, the uh, raw materials, manufacturing, packaging, transport, use and service, end of life. Incidentally, packaging we threw up there, um, it, it, for many that produce product, packaging is really just something of the part of the bill of materials. However, what we found with packaging was kind of interesting. Someone from the Environmental Defense Fund told me this, and it's been a great quote, is packaging is the gateway drug for sustainability. <laughs> I just love that. It's like, yeah, we're, we're doing some really cool stuff in packaging that has been really helpful. So um, if that's the, the, the where, the what, the lenses are, um, where are the impacts? So these are obvious, and this, is, this isn't rocket science, but we really wanted to make sure we were standardizing the way we approached all of this. So um, I just want to give you a picture of product development complexity because you know people say, well, it's, it's just like a it's simple, it's like a nutrition label. And the challenge with, 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 uh, with, with food is that at the end of the day, at the, when you finish making that Twinkie, I used to use it as a Twinkie as an example, you can still determine caloric content and all sorts of other things that are in that, are in that Twinkie. However, in a jacket, you really need to build this from the beginning all the way through that supply chain. And that supply chain is complex. And think of all those different impacts, all those ways that have to be additive. And we really need to do a better job of understanding those. So this. This, this really starts making your head hurt when you start thinking about the complexity of, of, of the challenge. So, it's hard. There's no question. Um, I, I, I love this here because it says in the middle, it goes, then a miracle occurs. Um, we've been searching for and actually found what that miracle is. That miracle is collaboration. Um, because the complexity of, we will never solve this alone. And that's really been a huge part of where we've been able to move forward. So recognition uh, for the work that we did in creating the eco-index. Uh, you can just see some of the quotes that are up there. Uh, it was clear that, that we had something special. And it wasn't the index that was special, it was the ability to create the index. Um, some people really love this picture here because it's one of the only pictures you'll see of me in a suit. Um, uh, we actually got an award, the Outdoor Institute got an award for, um, for this effort. Um, and actually, you mentioned Betsy Blaisdell. You see her, she's... Um, in the picture there, we had a little a day at the White House, which was, was pretty special. So that was great, uh, and we really moved forward on that. Um, the challenge is that um, we needed scale. We need a lot more things that we could only do so much in the outdoor industry. So this is where the Sustainable Apparel Coalition came along. And so um, credit to Patagonia, even Chenard and uh, uh, Rick Ridgway at Patagonia in talking to Walmart actually moved forward saying we need to address uh, product sustainability in the apparel supply chain. So that's where the beginning of the Sustainable Power Coalition came in. And um, it was uh, all of a sudden um, became big league because what we created in the Eco Index now had enormous scale. And here, the outdoor industry is really teaching the broader apparel industry how to collaborate and how to solve problems. Uh, love that figure. One third of $1.4 trillion involved in the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. So um, really quickly, what it is, is essentially it's the Eco Index, some of the fantastic work that Nike has done on, on a material sustainability index, and some work from what's called the GS GSCP, or the Global Social Compliance Program, as we do assessment around facilities. This is a uh, compilation of all the projects that we're working on right now. And when you have uh, uh, probably the equivalent of a thousand people organized in uh, uh, addressing the challenge. Now, incidentally, it, this, the, uh, representative of brands, but it's also multi-stakeholder. We have everything from NGO to government involved in this process to academia. And it's been really, really rewarding to see the energy. Um, we were just last week working on chemicals management where it's being described that we are reinventing the way chemicals are used, not just in apparel, but in, in, in industry, industry. 
And it's, and it's fundamentally doing systems thinking to say, how do we look at chemicals and chemicals management across the entire space? But there's all sorts of ways, including social labor um, being incorporated into that. Um, the other thing, too, is we're seeing because the tools actually work really well for apparel, they also really work well, obviously, for footwear. We're working on the bicycle industry. We're doing all sorts of scale into other industries using the same tools. So what does this mean and um, uh, where are we going? Um, what we've built is really obvious. It's a roadmap. It's a roadmap for improving um, and is providing an amazing opportunity for benchmarking, whether you're a facility or whether you're a brand, um, whether you're a retailer, it's actually providing tools for the supply chain by the supply chain. And it's, it's been fa fascinating to see how that's moved forward. It's really creating a race to the top. Um, you know, we're really looking forward to, and we've got a couple of our first action projects. One of them is most likely going to be around chemicals management and uh, all, all the work around the detox zero, zero discharge effort. Um, and ultimately, we're really working back towards that means to engage the consumers. So, how'd I do? <laughs> Director of Sustainability for Prana, and uh, um, I just wanted to introduce Prana to um, some of you in the room may not know the the company. Um, it uh, it was a um, started as a you know, we are a, a clothing outdoor lifestyle brand um, with with strong roots in climbing um, as well as in yoga, um, and Prana is an interesting company because um, the values are very strong, but um, transforming that into uh, a formal intentional program has been um, our journey, the first slide, our sustainability journey for the last few years. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit today um, because about um, labor as, as um, Stacy referenced, and, and I think because what to me has, has been most um, evident is that um, this is a pretty awful industry that we're in and it's not it, it's not it used to be awful I mean it currently is pretty awful and um, because of that I'd like it's very similar to Stacy's um, I have a vision for how it's not going to be and it's it's not a vague vision and, and what's really exciting it's it's very clear and it's implement it's led to a plan that I'm going to talk a little bit about um, we're here today, I think, because we feel that we want it to be a better journey. I mean, we want to be a part of something better. We don't want to be polluting and damaging the world. Um, and what's really interesting is that I look at this race to the bottom that we did as an industry about how to exploit and get the most out of. And in a wonderful way, because we all love winning races, we won. And because we've won, we've got this bit of a mess on our hands. And that bit of a mess is what is now inspiring people to say, wait a minute, I want to see change. Um, we were able to build a multi-billion dollar or trillion dollar industry um, on the backs of, of, of people. Um, many people were exploited. Many people were put into harmful situations, currently are, not, and their rights are not um, supported. Uh, and working conditions are poor, and I've seen that. And it's a pretty difficult thing to admit. Um, so, you know, that's one piece of the puzzle, you know, we have the operations supply side. And then we're also at a time right now where there's this consumer um, awareness, like I don't want that. I don't want to be a part of that system, but so how do I change? Um, and what's really exciting is that momentum is exploding in a big way. I was on a, uh, a 
webinar the other day with from um, Textile Exchange, which is a nonprofit working on sustainability within the textile industry, um, and they were talking about millennials. And something like 79% of millennials use social and environmental filters in their purchases. And it's so inspiring because I come today, we spent talking about sustainability, and there was a room full of passionate people who said, yes, that's important to me, I want to, I want to be a part of that. And then the, just to hear that there's, there's a knowledge and awareness in the younger um, generation, which is so exciting. Uh, and then it makes me feel old. <laughs> um, so, so that brings me to sort of this is the landscape, and this is where um, you know Prana wanted to be a part of a different system, and we wanted to look at what is that? What is that? Um, and so um, I want to talk to you today about um, our fair trade uh, certification pilot project that we did. Um, so for some of you who may or may not know, um, fair trade is in, you buy your coffee, your tea, your chocolate. Um, it's the same, it's the same idea, it's the same organization, Fair Trade USA, um, had the realization that what was the other products that they could be offering to consumers that say this belief, this is part of my values and I want to support it through my um, purchasing. Um, and clothing was obviously a very big piece of that, so that came up. Um, so just very quickly for those of you who aren't aware of the Fair Trade system, um, it's what I love about it is it's not charity. It's not like buy this and donate. It is actually a different way of doing business. Um, and uh, it's an organization, they, they rely on certification. Um, they verify global supply chains. Um, they put a huge emphasis on worker voice and worker rights. Um, and they have a big um, foundation in uh, working conditions being of a certain level. Um, so the certification begins with just a, a, a very standard, um, uh, clear set of standards for working conditions. And then the second part, which is the part that's always been missing for most compliance programs that exist out there, is the focus on worker empowerment. So workers are trained on their rights, um, and, and this could be at the cotton farmer or it could be at a factory, um, and they're trained on community development um, and that part of um, aspect of fair trade. And then what else is really exciting is there are specific brand responsibilities. So as a brand who's involved with fair trade, um, we buy our products from, and we pay a price for our goods and then we also pay a premium uh, that goes directly to the workers. Um, so when we piloted this program, we wanted to know two things. Is this even possible in a supply chain or is this just a pipe dream? Like this idea that we could actually help improve workers' lives. And, and also, do customers really care? Like, we hear all the time, I'll pay more for it, but will you? And that's what we wanted to know. And what's exciting is the answer to them is both yes. So we started out with a t-shirt. <laughs> I love this photo because this t-shirt represents a lot of work and a lot of sleepless nights. Um, but in five seasons, we have increased from five t-shirt, or from one t-shirt to um, over 10 styles this season, and there's no end in sight. The exciting thing that I also love is that um, we have put um, $21,000 uh, back into the hands of workers. Um, there have been workers who've taken more money home because of this fair trade program to improve their livelihoods themselves. Um, and we also had the really exciting um, opportunity to help build a school next to one of our factories that we worked with. Well, um, we've seen an increase in sales, and we have seen intense consumer um, affinity for the program. And the other beautiful outcome that I, we didn't really expect is the internal buy-in and the um, passion inside the company just blossomed. People who were like, what is this? Is it gonna affect my costs? What are my delivery times gonna look like? How does that all work? Um, to, we gotta make this happen, because this is so important. And that has been one of the things that's really just um, oh, the counter's going the other way, I see. <laughs> um, so, so I just, just sort of in, in closing, I think what's happening right now from our perspective is we are on the edge of a shift and change. And, um, you know, the fair trade consumer, I think, right now is a bit niche, but I think that is shifting. Um, and what we're seeing is that um, 
for me in my role, I constantly get emails or letters from people that say, you should do better. You shouldn't exploit people. You shouldn't go to the cheapest countries without infrastructure. And you should you know, be better. And I think what's exciting is that this is an opportunity to say, you're right. And there is, there's an option for doing better. Um, I get really excited too because on the highest level, um, the UN has really, um, uh, the Glo UN Global Compact has endorsed uh, John Ruggie's um, Protect, Respect, and Remedy framework, which is really critical in CSR to say, you know, there are roles of governments and there are roles of companies, and, if, and this is what it looks like. And so it's not wishy-washy, it's not vague, it's very specific framework, and that's very passionate, because that's at a very high level. And then at the very grassroots level, I think, I love that digital media is, is so hot and is exploiting people and exploiting companies, and, and, I, and we want to get called out, because we have an opportunity to say, this bad behavior doesn't have to continue. Um, so, I think what, you know, fair trade is still in its infancy. It's, um, it's, it's, you know, we don't have a ton of styles. Um, it's growing, but still, I think what it's done is it's made us believe that there can be a different standard out there, and that's something that we should rally around and we should get behind. Um, so I think our vision for a future of clothing is one that definitely fully incorporates workers, gives workers empowerment, and to say, like, throughout the supply chain, can we leave everyone better off for having been a part of our production? So thank you. consultant from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I work with designers and sustainable apparel brands on marketing, social media, and branding. Um, a few years ago, you know, it was fine for a company to market themselves as we're eco, we're ethical, we're green. But now, as that sort of trend is rising, um, you can't use that just to set yourself apart. Um, so I help brands sort of create a story around their products. Um, just so you have a little bit of background, since I don't have names like REI and Prana behind me, um, I started a brand called Revolution Apparel um, with my co-founder, Kristen. Um, we were travelers by, you know, at heart um, and saw a need for versatile clothing that could just be thrown in a backpack and taken with us wherever we wanted to go. Um, so we designed a piece called the Versalette. And it's one garment that can be worn over 20 different ways. Um, it's made of all recycled material and made in the USA. <clears throat> Which brings me to my work now. And um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the design side of the future of clothing and what the role is of the designer, but more importantly, what is the responsibility? So there are three parts to this as I sort of look look to the future, and um, it's modular design, repurposed design, and versatile design. And those are all very boring words, but I promise that it's going to be a, a little more engaging and creative than that. Um, I'm going to talk about modular design first, and there are three things that sort of encompass modular design, and that's detachment, inter interchangeability, and customization. And instead of sort of going through those concepts, I'm going to give you examples of um, designers who are doing uh, modular design. This is a designer out of New York City called um, Carrie Perry. And I love Carrie's story because um, this collection is called Mrs. Montague Collection. And her inspiration for it was a housewife in the 1830s who got so fed up with washing her husband's shirts that she cut the collar off of the shirt, 
washed it separately, and then sewed it back on. And all of the um, pieces on Carrie's uh, collection have collars that pop, come off, cuffs that come off, and bows that come off. And she's really trying to get the consumer to engage in the creation of the garment so that it's an art and it's something beautiful. Um, and so she's doing that um, and, and really doing it seasonless and um, you know, occasionless, meaning you can dress it up, you can dress it down. Then we have Ultra 10. Um, it's a Malaysian sustainability collective and these are 10 pieces that can be worn, um, ultimately that you wouldn't need anything else in your wardrobe other than these 10 pieces. They're made of all sustainable fabrics, and if you return the 10 pieces at the end of the season, you get a 50% discount on the next season's line of 10 pieces. Um, with just a pull of the zipper, a coat can become a jacket or a skirt or a shirt. Um, and, and I think that some of these pieces are a little bit unrelatable for the normal consumer, because um, we're not all high fashion minimalists walking around. Um, but the, the point here is that modular design can be applied to casual wear, athletic wear, anything that you can think of. Um, and, and that's really the goal, is to take pieces that um, can be used in many different ways for many different occasions and many different seasons. <clears throat> and then we have repurposed design, and that encompasses clothing waste, upcycling, and dead stock fabric. This is a designer named Elizabeth Bruner who I met in San Francisco um, last summer, and I walked into her studio, it was beautiful, just white walls and big open windows, and there were bookcases everywhere with stacks of little fabric swatches stacked up, um, all sorted by color and pattern. And um, she takes the fabric swatches that are usually you know, looked at, you know, the designer picks you know, which one they want for the season, and then that's discarded, thrown into the landfill because it's just a square of fabric. So she patches them together in a sort of quilt-like fashion and creates customized, one-of-a-kind, gorgeous, garments. Um, Orsola de Castro is doing something similar. She launched um, a Reclaim to Wear project uh, with Topshop, which is the equivalent of like a Forever 21 in England. And they're taking textiles um, out of the landfill, repurposing them, and turning them into sort of patchwork-like pieces as well. And sort of on a different thread, um, but also on this repurposing um, spectrum. Lily Ashwell is a designer that's very new. She just launched her uh, first line in December, and she takes dead stock fabric and turns them into pieces that are seasonless, again, beautiful. Uh, oftentimes there's a surplus of fabric rolls. You know, it's, in the fashion industry, it's always better to have too much than too little. So there are yards and yards of fabric that go unused. Um, and she takes those and, and creates uh, lines that are limited edition. Once they're sold, they're done, um, and it's made in the USA. And the last um, aspect of design I want to talk about is versatile design. And that means multiple styles, multiple occasions, and multiple seasons. As I mentioned, um, my co-founder and I created the Versalette. It's one garment, it can be worn as a, a shirt, a skirt, a scarf, a poncho, a purse, you name it. Um, made of recycled fabrics in the USA. And um, the idea is if you have garments that can be worn in different ways, then you don't need such a surplus of garments in your wardrobe. And then there's the 12 ways dress, which I call the sassier version of the Versalette because it's um, it's um, not sustainable in its fabric, but sustainable, sustainable by nature. And that's sort of a, a big point I want to make is you can't be perfect in every way. There is no perfect solution yet. But because this cuts down on the number of clothing that you buy and purchase and use, um, by nature that is sustainable. And then just to close, I want to um, 
just leave you with, the, if you're a designer or if you teach designers um, or if you're interested in design, more than ever, we have, the designers have to be innovators. And they have to look at the resources that are available to us and how to use them, with, use what we have and not look to virgin fibers and, and using um, textiles that have to be replenished over and over again. Let's look at what we have, what we can use, and uh, a better way to do things. Thank you. Everybody. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a PowerPoint, um, but I think um, I'm going to keep it light anyways. Uh, we have Rethink Fabrics has a very different approach to sustainability than uh, most of the speeches you've heard today. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Ann Sodeman, in case you forgot. I'm the CEO of Rethink Fabrics, which is a Seattle-based company. Um, we've been in business since 2008. And all we specialize is, is um, recycled polyester made out of plastic bottles. That's all we do. It is actually a brand promise that at least 30% of all of our garments has recycled PET in it. Most of our garments, however, do have 100%, uh, which is something that was very uh, dear to Stacy to incorporate. And uh, when we, as I go and talk a little more about where we're going into the future, you would know why she insisted uh, that it would be 100%. Um, we at Rethink believe that we need to demystify this whole world sustainability. We believe that we need to make recycling sustainable clothing accessible to the end consumer and uh, we do that through a very simple storytelling. Each of our garments, we have calculated how many plastic bottles went into it. So right now, for instance, I'm wearing 11 plastic bottles. And that's kind of our main message. As much as I admire everything that REI has done through the Apparel Coalition and so forth, I think sometimes you can also overwhelm your audience with too much information. That's not to say that the hard work doesn't need to be done, because you need to have the info to back it up. However, I do think there's nothing wrong with trying to, as I say so often, sexy this up a bit. <laughs> and that does not mean that, uh, especially since you know that our fabric developer is Stacy, that we do not care about credibility, making sure that all of our fabrics are certified, has a tracer in it, and certainly always try to expand sustainability in everything we do in business. Uh, initially, we focused on the recycling piece, which is all you know related to the sustainable uh, and environmental piece of sustainability. But we're also trying to keep doing more, whether it's talking about workers' conditions and moving production closer to home, and hopefully this year at home. So. Um, let, let me talk a little bit about what challenges we've had and uh, where I see our uh, little company is doing with sustainability into the future. First of all, uh, simplifying a story and taking such a complex issue as the benefits of recycling, uh, it, it takes a lot of thought. And again, as we have said in, in, uh, in Rethink, is we want to simplify it. And even though we do have a very significant, we call it the Rethink Index, where we can track various uh, um, uh, water savings, CO2 savings, and uh, it has been a big work uh, where we have worked very intensively with our fiber mill, with our uh, cut and sew factory to make come up with these uh, calculations. Um, we still try to focus on one message, and that is how many plastic bottles are in this T-shirt. 
Secondly, what we also do, and that is a fact, is we have been challenged um, with uh, you know, competitive pricing. Uh, that will always be a factor in when you, when you do apparel. Uh, I think it's fair to say that a lot of us would love to do well for the environment, but not on behalf of an inferior quality product. And as long as a product changes hands more time than, so, than often, it keeps adding on to the price point. We would like to think that this is something we are about to overcome. Uh, I have seen the gap close within the five years uh, we have been in business significantly. So we are on the right track to close that gap. And it's also one of our brand promises that the quality absolutely can never be compromised. We don't think that the fact this is recycled, this is sustainable, that doesn't sell a product in itself. It has to be equal quality or even better, better quality than what's out there in Virgin. And then when the consumer has the choice, they, they, they will gravitate towards the story and the sustainability. Uh, also, what has been quite a, a, a challenge for us has finding the right partners. And I think it's very true uh, about scalability, and especially from REI or Prana, who's much better, uh, bigger, not better. That was a mistake. <laughs> Scratch that. <laughs> uh, but bigger company than us, you know, they have different, they have different, a different structure, different needs than we do. We, we, can, we can do things that you can't do and vice versa. Uh, but I, I, I do think that for us, we have found out the hard way that bigger is not always better for us. And there's nothing wrong with building your company in increments and try to just keep adding on layers and find the right partners to have the same values as you and then expand from there instead of going in uh, as we actually did to a big sports brand uh, that was actually early on and um, a very big sports brand that everyone knows but I will not mention um, you just have to trust me and they, they came in and they said sure we love sustainability we love uh, the environment, but quite frankly, we don't care about it. What we think is it's cool that you can take plastic bottles and turn it into a t-shirt. That's what we want. So we started and was like, okay, well, we are more concerned with getting this product into the mainstream and into market. So we'll take it, you know. And when you have these conversations and you go down the road uh, uh, with them after a year, they all of a sudden want. 100% recycled PT with all the performance features. They would love the fair trade piece. They would love everything. And then we end up discussing, you know, 10 cents at the end of the day. That's the problem. So that leads me to another point that we have had, a challenge we have had, is really we get so much positive feedback. Mind you, most of our sales are wholesale from, from retailers private labels, but at the end of the day, there are very few companies that are willing to walk the walk and talk the talk that they are all discussing. Prana is one of them. Actually, we sell t-shirts to Prana. <laughs> so uh, uh, that has really been a challenge too, and that's what I refer to as Soto Green Companies. It's the companies that want all the glory and accolades that goes with having a recycled product, but are not really willing to do the work for it. And I like to think that is changing too. I know it is because uh, as of this year too, we're collaborating with, with, with several retailers. So it is, we are on the right path. Uh, of course, nothing will ever go as fast as you one would like in a business, but uh, at least it's, it's on the right path. So what I, what we have done, and one of the things that Stacy also and I have talked about is, you know, what amount of pa patience and endurance that needs to go into this business. And I think Kevin also touch, uh, touched on that, that it's, 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 a long, it's a long road. It's not something that comes easy. But I like to think that uh, what we have rethink are doing, even though we may not have, you know, had a global influence or anything, 
I like to think that we have influenced people of all ages uh, in a level where they can all participate by referring to our bottle count, trying to keep it simple and not to, to try and, and dumb people down, but to try and make it accessible and relatable to people. We have done uh, several uh, projects to try and engage people in a, in a completely different way uh, through something we call the Rethink Circle, where we actually collaborated with the Black Eyed Peas on their concert tour, uh, where we had volunteers out, uh, handing out pamphlet, had them do a video, uh, so they were wearing our shirts, selling our shirts. And I think it's initiatives like that as superficial that they may seem on the surface as, as a marketing stunt, I really think there's nothing wrong with commercializing sustainability. Actually, I think it's a necessity. I think we have to depart from the fact that, oh, sustainability always has to be associated with charity or something that is higher. There's nothing wrong with, with, with going out and market yourself and profit from it either, which is, after all, what all businesses at the end need to do. So um, if you want to feel a Rethink Fabrics, I was actually told that they have our shirts out there in front. And um, so go out and feel a shirt. Feel free to buy one too. <laughs> but I really want, oh, I have, to, I have to give credit for this and then, I'll, uh, and then I will um, uh, get off the stage. Uh, or at least have people join me. Uh, but um, the reason why I said that it was important that it was 100% recycled PET is that it allows for two features. First of all, you can do a very eco-friendly sublimation printing, which is basically where you take a digital print on the shirt, which allows you to use it as a canvas, uh, which is uh, what Dale Chihuly did with a lot of our shirts. Um, and second, and this is really one of, of Stacy's babies too, it also allows you to uh, reclaim the garment through a brand new technology called the Take Back program that Unify, one of our fiber mills, has just launched, where we can actually reclaim the shirts and start the process all over again. So basically a rethink shirt, uh, if it's run from our signature line that's 100%, never has to enter into a landfill. And that is what, you know, we truly call the yeah. So, um, oh, I'll, you know, <laughs> I feel like George Costanza, I should stop on a high note, but people are clapping. Thank you. know why I'm so psyched about this topic. So, all right, we've got, this is the Q&A portion. So does anybody have any questions they would like to ask the panel speakers? And how does this work? Do we give mics to someone or do they just yell? Yeah. Yell? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> For sure, uh, for us, I mean, uh, our fiber have comes, when, when you say local, I think of the U.S. Uh, uh, as opposed to the, to the Northwest, and that's really, a, uh, that's where the plant is. Um, but uh, certainly, right now we do, uh, we, we use U.S. yarn. Um, we take it over at the fiber state, we spin our own uh, uh, yarn, but our manufacturing is right now taking place in Guatemala, and, which is also, basically due to cost, but we're now working on also closing that game, adding that new um, aspect to our sustainability and uh, do U.S. production So um, in L.A., so the proximity certainly is, is a lot closer, so uh, that's what I call our neighborhood, too, is everything on the West Coast, basically. Shipping's the silent killer. <laughs> oh, you know that, and shipping costs. Yeah. <laughs> 
Anyone else? Yeah, I can, I can speak. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, uh, for those who know, uh, the majority of the products that we sell are, are, are um, produced. One of our big challenges uh, in this space, and, and there's definitely a move of, of products moving back from Asia, and sometimes in Central America, but we actually do our entire base layer, most of our base layer actually in North America, and, and been working on doing that. One of the challenges we face is that um, because so much of the materials that we make our products are of such high performance, there isn't even any mark, there isn't any um, source anymore. We can't produce a tent with materials made in the US. It's just, it's just not available. And so, um, you know, right or wrong, that, that market has moved. So to be able to produce a tent, cut and sew a tent in, in the US would mean we could do it from the imported materials. So supply chains are really global, and, and, and that's a, a challenge we face now. Where we can, we clearly have, have, have been able to, to, to address some of that, but it's, um, it's a really complex challenge. Yeah, and I'll add to that a little bit. I think um, people akin food and clothing, like I hear that argument a lot, and I, it's, it's different arguments, and um, when I worked at Patagonia, we did the Footprint Chronicles, and, and actually travel is less, is like 1% of the overall impact of the garment in shipping. Um, if you, whereas in food, most food's being shipped by air because of the perishability, and so that's a different, it's a different ball. Um, and I think as Kevin was saying, like the, the supply chain for apparel is so well established on a global level that to shift back is not just a like, I want to. You have to build the infrastructure for it. And that's existing and that's what's exciting is that more and more of that conversation is coming up. We were at a great meeting um, in the outdoor industry that said, okay, what are the actual barriers? And a big hand up was like, there's no schools that teach production anymore. Schools are teaching design. Everyone wants to be a designer and no one wants to go and work in a factory anymore. And so we have to shift the perception of what's valuable work. And, um, and I think that in itself, and as different things are evolving and perceptions are evolving, yes, yeah, some will come back, but it, it's different. Thank you so much. Okay, we've got a hand raised in the back. Do you want to stand up? jacket is, you know, probably going to last you longer than a nylon jacket from, sorry, Walmart, Walmart. Um, and, and I think that's where sort of the cost comes in. What's the durability of the fabric, you know, the, the make of it, you know, how long is that going to last you? And I think you have to think about that when you're thinking about cost. Um, you guys can probably talk more on the business infrastructure of it, but from a consumer standpoint, I think that if we buy buy apparel that lasts us longer, then in the long run we'll be better off. We'll save money. Well, I'll, I'll be happy just to comment on on as I said, most of our businesses wholesale, so it's a little bit different than than Prana and REI, but uh, I, I I I feel that the gap between recycled material as it relates to PET, which again, is a, that's, that's our niche business, it's all we do, and virgin uh, uh, PET, and, and forgive me, it, it means polyester, uh, um, I think that gap is so small now that I really don't think 
that price is driving a consumer for one or the other. I think the problem is that right now, the consumer don't understand what they're paying that extra 10, 15% for. And that's why I go back to trying and, 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 and mentioning what, what we're trying to do is educate people, just make it simple. Tell them this is, this is made from six, 12, 15 water bottles, uh, plastic bottles that's now not entering into a landfill that's now not in the oceans. And, and just understand that these small things can have such a huge impact and, and, and again, not overwhelm them. And I think there's still work to be done. I mean, we're, we're, we're doing it, but I think for the most part, if the quality, all things being equal, I, I think it's really just a matter of explaining to people where, what is it that you are paying that extra 10 and 15% for. And if you see the brands that have truly been successful in sending a fairly simple commodity, for instance, Tom's Shoes. Their messaging of where that extra money you go for a fairly simple pair of shoes, it's so easy to grasp. People get it, and they're willing to pay for it as long as they understand why they are paying for it. And I think that's the challenge that we have right now. Yeah, you know, it's hard to have the sustainability conversation without the cost question coming up, and it's a it's a legitimate one because we we, we face it all the time as business. Um, but uh, you know, one of the challenges, and we'll know we're successful when we stop having the sustainability conversation, <laughs> and, and that we really, you know, everything that we do requires energy and resources, and you know, we're talking about using less. We're talking about using less chemicals. We're, talk, we're talking about using less of so much and, and it, removing a lot of the extra cost that just becomes embedded in the way we're do, doing business. And so ultimately we know we're successful when it's just great business. When we see a, a, a facility that is very sustainable, a, a textile mill, and they do, um, they, they get it right every time, and their quality is so high, they're way more sustainable. And, and so it's, it's really, this is where the concept of product integrity includes quality, includes you know, um, social responsibility, includes uh, uh, environmental responsibility, and that's the place where we need to get to. And honestly, we haven't proven that well enough yet, and that's one of our big opportunities, is, is to be able to show that. I will say, one of the fastest growing brands at REI is, is Patagonia, and, and never been accused of being low cost. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's, you know it's, it, and it's the thing, you know, as Yvonne says, don't buy this jacket if you don't need it. Um, but if you do, it's gonna last. Tausha. Um, yes, um, I think what we're seeing now is more about creative fashion and um, something around like uh, ownership or design around uh, fashion. So for instance, um, Prana, the outdoor industry is uh, kind of an old <laughs> dinosaur. We run on two seasons a year. So you get to buy two different options a year and then you get the fast fashion which has multiple seasons but what we're also seeing is, is that there's an opportunity to have um, replenishments or tweaks or changes on things that may not re we may not redo the whole system but we might be able to respond better to what the consumer is interested in and so I think with that there's like the fast fashion is more it can still be fast and it can be sustainable. It's more about the disposable or the sort of fashion. And I think there's a differentiation there. I think you can still have something that's fashion changing, but it might be that it's the same color, but the design is tweaked slightly, or we're putting different colors together or something like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, it's there, the disposable piece of fast fashion is not where we're going to go, but an idea to build a consumer engagement around your clothing and your relationship with it, I think, is a trend that we're seeing. Yeah, I, 
I think that there is a sort of paradigm shift happening, happening with consumer psychology. Um, especially you're seeing the minimalist movement grow a lot, um, and that's becoming sort of no longer just trendy, like it's an actual thing for men and women alike. Um, and we just don't want as much stuff in our lives. It's cluttering, and, and, it, and so I think the psychology around that is sort of prompting us to want less smaller wardrobes, want less, buy less, um, and in that case, you know, you're not as apt to go into a fast fashion outlet, buy something, wear it once, stick it in the back of your closet. <laughs> I will say one something briefly on that. Um, I think it's a great question. Um, I, I, I'm really happy that both um, H&M and Inditex, who is the um, parent company for Zara, are a member of the Sustainable Power Coalition because that becomes great conversation to be able to be a part of that. So we don't have an answer, but it, it puts it out there. I know H&M has just launched their new, um, you know, bring clothing back to be recycled. Um, that that's also a huge, huge thing that, to start the conversation. The take back. Yep. Yep. All right. I'm very interested in business wear and uh, like that sort of clothing, specifically menswear, slacks, <coughs> you know, trousers, all that sort of stuff. Are you guys seeing anything cool coming up in office and business wear uh, that you might be able to mention? Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Actually, um, if you're familiar with Kickstarter, um, there's a minist Ministry of Supply as a line that launched. Um, as a bun actually a bunch of engineers from MIT who came up with this technology for like um, business shirts that. I don't know all the details about it, it's a little beyond me, but the, you don't sweat, it doesn't smell, you don't have to wash it as much. Um, so that's one ministry, ministry of Supply, they're doing all business shirts. Um, I had a question on the, the Hague Index. Are, what's the role of the dye houses and the, the huge dye houses and mills and those producers overseas, are they also actively participating in the standard? Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, next week I'm heading over to uh, to Asia, and we're working with some of the better, uh, and really, it's, and it's we're really, we're, we're creating, um, one of the real opportunities is that um, there's so many good practices out there. I mean, there's, there's a lot of really bad, but there's so much good, and one of the challenges is always then how do you add scale to what's good? And so that's what we're really looking to do, is where, I, I've got a person in, um, in Asia, and, and I say, every day you wake up and find someone doing something good. And let's add scale to that, because we have the entire coalition to figure out how to, to be able to do that. So um, absolutely, it's multi-stakeholder, it, it is all the way from chemical companies, uh, up through textile mills, dye houses, wash houses, um, uh, brands and retailers, NGOs, it's multi-stakeholder. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously, it, it's helpful to have a lot of brand driving it, um, because that's usually where, you know, the, 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 the money comes from, but it's, um, the important thing is, as we go into the supply chain, we're, we're not there to, we're not there to judge them. We're there to, and, and you see the change when you start to see you're here to provide me with tools to help me assess where we're going. I knew we were successful when we went to a wash house that was actually closing down in China. They're building another one in, in a different, you know, sort of in a different region where it's not going to be looked at quite closely. They pulled up the Hig Index facilities assessment, gave it to their engineers, and said, "Here, what can we do that would give us a better score here?" I was like, "Perfect." That's exactly the behavior we want. And, sorry to keep asking. Do you also work in uh, conjunction with the NRDC's Green by Design program? Yeah, and NRDC is actually a member of, uh, Linda Greer is a member of the, uh, has been participating in the SAC as well. So, yeah, absolutely.
I had a question with, with respect to the, the supply chain and fair trade certification as it plays out in clothing. Um, you, as I've been learning more about fair trade, I've learned about uh, equal exchange and um, their definition of fair trade, which includes uh, not sourcing from plantations as part of their sort of like development and solidarity uh, definition of, of fair, uh, fair trade. So I was wondering what, what were the, you know, in Fair Trade USA does not have that, that requirement in terms of its uh, commodities that <coughs> important. Um, so I was wondering, how does that play out in terms of the, 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 the supply chain for, for clothing, the clothing, you know, the clothing industry? Because it is Fair Trade USA, right? And uh, to tack on to that too, maybe you can talk about the differences between fair trade in textiles and apparel. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Between like chocolate and coffee. Oh, and stuff. Okay, yeah. Um, whew, okay, so this is a big one. So um, your question is really good. Uh, very timely and, and, and quite political actually, um, as you know. So the fair trade movement um, came very rooted out of um, cooperatives, um, a lot of um, structural businesses that were very worker-centric and supported. Um, so um, equal exchange is, uh, that's their belief system. Fair Trade International, again, that's their belief system. And so, and Fair Trade USA, that was part of their system. Fair, fair Trade itself is like something like less than one quarter of a percent of sales in this country. And so Fair Trade USA said, we want to scale. And by doing that, we want to get more um, money and opportunities to workers on a larger level, and so Fair Trade USA has expanded both in product categories and in the types of um, uh, workers that they're going to work or plantations and the large scale. So it's a strategy, it's an approach. Um, it does move away from that sort of very core part of the fair trade movement, and people have um, different opinions on that. So that's one thing. Um, fair trade apparel, it, it, it's not applicable. So there aren't plantations versus cooperatives. Um, versus, the structure isn't the same the way it has been with like chocolate and coffee and, and bananas. Um, so when the change happened and Fair Trade USA went on their own, it actually didn't affect us at all um, from, a, from the program. So Fair Trade Cotton has been around for many, many years. It's a part of Fair Trade International, and in Europe, Fair Trade cotton products are sold, um, but it's only the cotton that's actually Fair Trade. Um, Fair Trade USA said we want to move that further up the supply chain. There are workers, especially in um, garment factories, that um, do not get um, good working conditions and do not get access to decent wages, and there's they have communities and needs as well. And so that's they piloted to bring um, the factory piece into that into that puzzle. So when we make our Fair Trade clothing products, you can um, ours are all. Actually, we went another step further. We did organic fair trade. And um, so we have a full uh, label for our products. But you, they, you can decouple it. And you can buy fair trade cotton only or fair trade factory only. And this fair trade factory would apply to something like 100%, you know, a recycled poly, because you're not going to get a, f you know, there's no fair trade poly farms. <laughs> Hopefully that answers your question some. Aaron, yes. I'm, I'm so sorry, I have so many choices. <laughs> uh, I was for uh, Prada and REI, but more for Prada, because I think you mentioned um, specifically talking about labor, and you talked about going through offering a limited line and a fair trade line, but then you also touched on a Made in the USA product. So I wanted to ask how much of that was done <coughs> by your consumer to offer that as something, or how much of that was company culture driving that, and then also for the uh, gentleman from REI, since you mentioned that it's very um, difficult, if not impossible, to find sourcing for some of your tents here uh, in the United States, are you not getting that type of demand from your cons consumers and customers so that you can then um, offer those products as a, as a made in the USA or something like that? So if you could maybe touch on that a little bit. I'll start. Um, I sort of see sourcing as a bit like a your mutual fund, like your your retirement plan. You do not want all your eggs in one basket, and so it gets spread out. And there's different strategic reasons why you do that. Um, Made in the USA is great because you get quick turns. You can manage production better. Um, and so where there can be product that's done here, um, we we do do product here. We do about 25% of our product in the U.S. 
Um, there isn't a fair trade program, and, but then we, sorry, so then we do a lot of product in India and, um, and China as well, and there, you can't, right now there isn't a fair trade domestic program, and so it was looking at, okay, what is the best practice out in the, in the market there? You can't do fair trade in China because of their laws around freedom of association, so um, that's why we did fair trade in India where we are, and then, but we also do do U.S. manufacturing. So it's it's about that sort of looking at that diverse um, sourcing strategy, and um, sort of trying to like work our best way into the different pieces that we have. Yeah. So for the tech technical product, um, so the, the 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 textiles we use in tents come from Taiwan or or Japan. I mean, that's where the incredible high-end performance materials. So in order for us to even, if we could find a facility to cut and sew in the U.S., um, it still would probably come from Taiwan. Because it's, a, it's a, and, and if, you, if you break down the bill of materials for a tent, which is actually pretty complicated, um, the, it, it's coming from places all over. So it's um, you know so it, it's it's better to start with things that that are simpler or have a, a more simpler supply chain. Um, we were actually be able to do we actually did some recycled polyester from the same Unify, Polar Tech, Cut and Sew in Los Angeles stuff like that um, was was a, was a, a, it was a simpler uh, process to be able to do that. Margaret. Know what types of things you're doing to educate the consumer because it seems to me that it all starts with the consumer demand. And I'd like to know what types of things you're doing to educate them on the need for sustainable clothing, single cables prices. <laughs> I asked Kevin to buy it and then Aria advises, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, that is that is huge. I think that's the biggest issue. And interestingly enough, when um, a year, two years ago at Prana, we had a strategic, our sustainability program went from being very informal to very strategic. And our design team said, fine, we will start building in sustainable decisions into the decision making process. And then they pointed the finger across the room, but marketing, you better be on board because if we build it, they better come. And so marketing has to be proactive about telling that story. Um, one project I'm really excited about, it'll be out in two weeks from now, is um, a bunch of companies in the um, who you are using organic cotton came together through textile exchange and said, we are all trying to educate and sell the consumer on organic cotton. Why don't we collectively put resources together to tell a consumer facing story? And so we're coming out with a two and a half minute video um, about why you as a consumer should be thinking about organic cotton. And I thought that was really innovative because it means that us as an industry, if we can sort of move that consumer level up, we're, you know, those 10 brands are gonna reach such a broader audience than just a single brand doing it on their own and it was way less expensive. So, um, and you'll talk to collaboration, but I think the more we do that within the industry, like our resources go down and the education piece goes up. But you have to be on it and you have to be like, it's on our Facebook, it's on our Twitter, it's on our, blog, it's, we're writing stories about it, it's on the hang tags, like it's just whatever channel we have, like you have to tell the story. Um, disclaimer, I'm not on the, on the communications marketing side of things for good reason. Um, the, it's a great, I don't, I don't think that our organization does nearly a good enough job to do that. Um, but part of the challenge, and I will, I will say is, I mean, I feel like, and I often say I'm the biggest eco idiot on the planet. Um, because every time I learn something, I realize what I don't know. And so it's a really difficult discussion with consumers to say how much you really don't know. And what keeps me up at night is how messy and how dirty and the chemical challenges that we face in the, in the supply chain and how we really, really need to wrestle that to the ground. So it's a really good question. It's a really, I don't think as an organization we do it very well, um, but it's, um, but it's really important, and, and hopefully um, there is, uh, I like you know, what Nicole says, I mean really sometimes it's, it's, it's the collaborative effort to be able to do that. So as an individual organization, we have a role and responsibility, as we all do, and I love the, the 
the, you know, uh, talking about the bottles, I mean, that's really, that's really important uh, uh, information, but uh, um, it's a huge opportunity. It's also one that's really uh, a, a, a very big challenge. I really love that question, and I think it ties into why should you pay more for recycle? Um, we at Rethink have done a lot of collaborations with, with all sizes of, of private label brands. We actually cut our teeth with Disney doing both their uh, Earth Day programs in the U.S. and in, in, uh, in Europe as well. We've done collaborations with private labels in Europe. And in our experience, we usually are just part of the manufacturing Lindau brand as a co-branding effort. Uh, but there is a pattern here that the ones who are the best storytellers, the one who actually have the displays in the store with plastic bottles, those are the ones who has been most successful with our program or their program. We basically just complement their brand. Uh, you know, showcasing that it's recycled. So there's a, it, there, it is really not just for the, the consumer, but also for our collaborators' uh, success. It is very important that marketing is behind it uh, for, for the success of, of the program. At least that's the pattern we have seen. Uh, oddly enough, because you do have to pay a slight premium when it's recycled, we've also worked with some private labels that, I mean, it wasn't even in the product description on their website and and you know sadly enough when you have one black t-shirt with the same print and another black t-shirt there's five dollars difference you know it makes it kind of hard to know why and uh so it was a really really good question sorry i just think in the same breath you have to paint the picture for the consumer you know it's a lot to take in there's so many different variables and if you can really just spell it out for them and you know this is a water bottle now it's your t-shirt i mean that's really as basic as it needs to go and and with time i think too the more it's just blasted out at you um the, the consumer will eventually get it so unfortunately we have to stop with the questions tonight and um i'm gonna wrap wrap up the evening thank you so much all of you for talking about uh, the future of clothing one thing I would like to just um, note is that in terms of collaboration, we had uh, 28 people in a room today uh, for a stakeholder engagement exercise from the growers uh, through uh, Goodwill, who actually disposes of our garments in the landfills. And we had uh, textile mill representation, brand retail representation. The entire supply chain was in the room and we were taken through a professional systems analysis on, uh, on some of the issues we're facing in, in the industry. And um, I remain hopeful that we can continue to have this conversation at this level and start to really um, engage with consumers um, as well as an industry. And um, that is what I'm so happy to be a part of. Um, there is one particular person that I would really like to thank from the bottom of my heart for tonight, and that is Tausha Copeland. I don't even think she's here. But Tausha, <laughs> Tausha just walked out because she's the behind the scenes person making a lot of these things happen and the stakeholder engagement exercise uh, had a lot of people helping um, I'm now taking all of the all of this information our key leverage points uh, to New York City next um, next uh, week and um, I'm presenting them to students at the Fashion Institute um, to help guide them in what areas to focus on of, as they start to plan their careers and really focus on um, integrating purpose into their into their profession. And that's Tausha over there. So thank you so much, and uh, hopefully for uh, some uh, um, appetizers. And thank you so much, and I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Woo!